Hello, everyone. So welcome back for our very last lecture of the semester. For this last due date, we'll be tackling Jeffrey Jerome Cohen's essay, Monster Culture, Seven Theses. And there's basically two ways to handle an essay like this. First, you could have gotten this piece during week one as a kind of introduction to monster studies. Or you could do what we're doing now and give it to you at the end of the semester. And this approach has one major advantage. In short, I'm not going to lie to you. Monster Culture is a very difficult essay. And I think it just goes easier for people if they've already spent seven and a half weeks studying how to analyze monsters. But the reason this essay is so hard, in my view, is because Cohen uses a lot of what we would call critical theory. Basically, in this essay, he is doing a cultural studies analysis of monsters through the lens of post-structuralist thought. And if that sounds incomprehensible to you, it might well be. You see, Cohen is writing for academics like me, not necessarily for undergrads like you. So he just assumes you know theorists like Derrida, Bakhtin, Foucault, others. He references all the time, but doesn't explain who they are, so he's assuming that you know them. And he also cites a ton of historical and cultural information that, unless you're exceptionally well-read, can be pretty challenging. So I'm giving this essay to you guys after seven weeks of doing monster analysis, just to help you out. And actually, you might remember the Cliff Notes version of Cohen that I gave you without mentioning his name um, back during the first brief lecture that we had. Does this slide jog your memory? Or how about this slide? More or less, these two slides are the gist of the conceptual tools that Cohen's essay is going to provide us now. Let us note, though, that Cohen only gave field of monster studies a name, and he also outlined a methodology for it. Human beings, however, we have always loved talking about monsters. And historically, we have placed monsters into one of three different categories. The largest category is probably what we would call teratology, or the study of monstrous births. Ancient writers loved to discuss these kinds of things. They would write bestiaries and lists and things like that. Some monstrous births are created through divine punishment. That's where we get Grendel, who's descended from Cain. And there are also monstrous hybrids, like the manticore or the basilisk, who are each an unnatural mixture of different critters. And of course, you also got purely accidental monstrous births, which thanks to genetics, uh, science even now kind of partially accepts. But then mythology, too, has a ton of fantastical creatures, as I'm sure you guys all know. Among the many things in this category are something cool called cryptids, or we little critters like Bigfoot, or the Loch Ness Monster, who, as pure animals, maybe they're anatomically possible, which puts them in a category different from centaurs, who aren't. But unfortunately, these cryptids, for you Bigfoot fans out there, they don't actually exist in real life. They're, they're implausible. But finally, we also have psychology as a category of monster. What this category asks is why do normal people who look non-monstrous might act in monstrous or inhuman ways? One obvious example are serial killers, but you also have normal people in this category who do terrible things due to certain ideological systems that are monstrous. For example, Nazism or slavery. All told though, a monster is always a type of warning, sometimes ominous, sometimes not. Here, some of you might find the words etymology useful or interesting. The word monster derives from the Latin monstrum, which is related to the verbs monstrare, which is to show or to reveal, and monire, which is to warn or to portend. So, revealing, warning, portending, monsters are all these things. With that in mind, Let's get back to Cohen. For now, I just want to walk you guys through his seven theses. Keep in mind that this walkthrough isn't a substitute for reading the actual essay, no matter how tough it is. For one thing, reading tough articles is how people improve as readers. Secondly, though, and a little bit more pragmatically, uh, for the take-home final, you're going to have to build your argument using two of Cohen's theses, and that requires citing his text and explaining relevant portions. So you kind of have to read the text first to find out that information so you can cite it. 
it might be best to think about this walkthrough as a guide in that set in, in, in this case. Now, some of you, granted, maybe you don't need a walkthrough for a tough essay. And if that's true, that's fantastic, actually. That's phenomenal. But for me personally, I always do kind of find these things quite helpful. In fact, every time I am assigned a dense or theoretically heavy article that I have to read for an essay or something that I'm writing, the first thing I do, I look up a reliable summary. Only then afterwards do I try to parse out how do the words on the page give rise to what the summary is saying that they actually mean. So for me, it's just a comprehension thing. And I hope that kind of strategy helps you guys along as well. With so, without further ado, thesis number one, the monster's body is a cultural body. At this point, it's worth emphasizing that the main idea for Cohen's whole essay is arch thesis, if you will. Uh, it's in page 37, and it says to it, we should read cultures from the monsters they engender. Although people have always been interested in monsters, what Cohen does is he makes studying monsters a part of the academic discipline we call cultural studies. So whereas people used to talk about monsters historically, just because they were inherently cool, what Cohen is doing, he is actually redirecting our focus of attention away from the monsters themselves and to the cultures that create those monsters. It's a relatively subtle shift, but in telling us that the monster's body is a cultural body, Cohen is telling us the monsters are made, not born. As he says, the monster is born only as an embodiment of a certain cultural moment, of a time, a feeling, a place. The monster's body is pure culture. And this is something we saw with the hook. In that urban legend, the monster, monster is embedded within 1950s America, and it exemplifies all these certain cultural fears that people are having about the new dating scene. Monsters, in other words, are woven into the fabric of the time and place that create them. What this means is we get the following commandment. Thou shalt interpret monsters through culture. For Cohen, a monster never just is. It's always a product of whatever cultural moment that gives it life. And that moment is what people in monster studies try very hard to understand. Thesis two, comes with the tricky title of The Monster Always Escapes. Now, this doesn't refer to what happens inside the story. For example, at the end of the vampire book, Dracula, Dracula is eventually killed by the heroes. But over the decades, 130 years actually, Dracula has kept coming back in dozens, if not hundreds of movies, novels, stories, ripoffs, you name it. No matter how many times Dracula is killed, he never dies, not permanently because artists and movie makers keep reinventing him. Here's the thing though. Every time a monster like Dracula or Grendel or the Hulk, every time they reappear, they reappear in a fundamentally new historical and cultural moment. The Dracula that appears in the original novel, for example, that's not the same Dracula who appears in the movie Bram Stoker's Dracula, directed in 1992 by Francis Ford Coppola. Um, that movie, by the way, is adorable because it shows Keanu Reeves trying so hard to act. But every time a monster like Dracula reappears, you have to read that newly reborn monster in light of the culture that thinks resurrecting that monster is worthwhile. In Thesis 3, the monster is a harbinger of, not of destruction, but of category crisis. This thesis is maybe a little more abstract than the others, but if you think about it, it's gonna make sense. You see, monsters are always hybrids. If you look at Frankenstein, he's an amalgam of different people's body parts. And in Mary Shelley's original novel, he's actually superior to normal human beings because of that hybridity. But these monstrous hybrids, they also mean that our ways of knowing things based on science, that can't be the sum total of truth. Those monsters, these hybrids, they exist outside of the scientific categories of knowledge that we have. And as such, the line between human and non-human is always blurred. The distinction that, that separates us from the non-human, that's never stable. And we saw this with Grendel's mother. 
On one hand, she is a horrible monster that must be destroyed. On the other hand, she is a grieving mother who's trying to participate in this ethic of revenge that Anglo-Saxon society held so dear. The monstrous becomes human, and sometimes the human becomes monstrous. So in thesis three, you always look for how monsters disrupt certainties that we have, the things we think we know. In the next two theses, four and five, they both raise what we would call social political questions. And since they're two of Cohen's longest sections, that tells you a little bit of something about where he thinks the action is. Basically, what cultural function does creating a monster serve? Why is creating monsters such a useful tool for human society? In thesis four, it tells us that the monster dwells at the gate of difference. Here, the category of monstrosity helps articulate an us versus them mentality. We are everything good, and they, them, are somehow everything bad. Cohen lists several historical examples of groups that have been monstrosized in the past, uh, including Native Americans, the Jews, the Aboriginal inhabitants of biblical Canaan. From our class, you might recognize the aliens from District 9, women like Jeanette Humphrey or Grendel's mother who step outside of their prescribed gender roles. And you might even recognize racialized minorities like Steve Harmon. Other groups that have been monstercized as well include people like uh, poor people, welfare recipients, political refugees, immigrants. The possibilities are endless. And that is why it is so important to figure out which group or groups are being monstercized in the culture and why. Likewise, in Thesis 5, the monster polices the border of the possible. We saw this especially in The Hook. In that urban legend, the monster acts as a warning to be careful when you're dating. But monsters can also safeguard other types of prohibitions. Ghosts, for example, may protect sacred or traumatized places like haunted houses or cemeteries. And in a movie like The Host, the monster is a warning against environmental pollution. Don't put formaldehyde into the Han River. And that's also a warning, by the way, against misusing science or technology. So overall, Thesis 5 says you must look for the prohibition. What is considered off limits by the story with a monster in it? Finally, we come to Cohen's last two theses. Thesis 6 is the one that maybe owes the biggest debt to psychoanalysis. The monster is a kind of desire. Every time you see a prohibition, people want to transgress that prohibition. No matter how many times H.P. Lovecraft tells us, don't ask too many questions about the cosmos, the answer might drive you mad. That does not stop readers from continually poking and prodding the mythos, the mythos of Cthulhu. All told, people just love crossing over into what is forbidden. It adds some spice to life, it adds to the fun. We want to do the things that are being prohibited. So being interested in monster stories and ghost stories and stories about aliens, we're really doing, what we're really doing is exploring in a safe way those things that are considered social taboos. Again, it's the cookie jar all over again. You tell a kid not to put their hand into the cookie jar, the first thing that kid's gonna do is he's gonna put his hand into the cookie jar. So thesis six is basically human beings using monsters to put our collective hand into the cookie jar. The last thesis in Cohen's essay is thesis number seven. The monster stands at the threshold of becoming. Personally, this is probably my least favorite thesis, and I would probably not recommend that you use this for your take-home essays. If you've been paying attention, for most of this essay, uh, the thesis, theses that Cohen has been offering, they're basically a conceptual toolkit for doing monster studies. They are created for the purpose of application. You apply these theses every time you see a monster, a ghost, an alien, or whatever. They're applicable. With thesis seven, however, it's not really a practical thesis in the same sense all the others were. For me, although the word, word hope never appears in the essay, that's fundamentally what thesis seven is all about. The figure of the monster for Cohen is not frightening per se. It's a chance to explore what, what the cultures that create monsters 
what they have to teach us. Monster studies is a chance to learn about ourselves. They help us explore being human by looking at what isn't human. So thesis seven is basically a hopeful clarion call for us to always make the effort to study our monsters. Because when we do that, whatever we find, no matter how hard or difficult or rigorous or horrifying the analysis might be, what we're gonna find in the end is gonna be very, very interesting. Thank you, both from me and from Baby Cthulhu.